Please. Okay. I'd like to call this meeting to order for the Knoxville Knox County Council on Aging. My name is Mary Sophia Hawks. I'm chair of the executive committee. Um, the executive committee met this afternoon. Prior to this meeting, uh, we have quite a few things on the docket. Most importantly, the monies that have to be allocated to programs in the area from the federal funding we uh, receive. Uh, those appointments, we do site visits every year to determine how that money is spent and if the people that are requesting it are worthy recipients. So this year the site visits are going to be a little different. They're going to be done virtually. Um, we will be having our own report on our site visits in March. And then that information will be presented to the entire council in April or in May. Angela. Angela? Sorry, um, it's going to be in April. In April. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, so you will want to be at that meeting to see where the federally funded monies go and to hear a little bit more about those programs. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dottie Wivers with the Office on Aging Report. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is staying safe where you are. Um, someday, hopefully, we'll be able to see you all in person. But until then, we're glad that we're able to connect you with our education piece of Council on Aging through this avenue. Um, so with the Office on Aging, we have many things going on. The one thing I really want to share with you is that on September, nope, I don't know what month we're in clearly, February 20th at 7 p.m., we will be having our virtual snowflake ball event that is supporting our senior companion program. And so if you're interested in joining us and have access to the internet, you can do so by visiting our website at knoxseniors.org. You will just um, go there at 7 p.m. on the 20th and participate virtually. You can wear your favorite outfit or you can sit in your pajamas in your home, um, whatever you are comfortable with doing. Um, and then we also will have an online silent auction that will be starting tomorrow at 4 p.m. and will be running through the 20th at 9 p.m. So we have about 70 to 80 different silent auction items that you can bid on. So if you're interested, interested in that, again, visit knoxseniors.org. Org. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, if you want to know more about what we have going on at the Office on Aging, you can call us at 524-2786. And I will turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Dottie. Uh, just a point of order for everyone. If you can mute yourselves, if you're not speaking, that will make it much easier to understand Dr. Vittori when she speaks to us. There will be a question session at the end. So write a note to yourself with your questions and then at the end we'll open it back up. We are all able to hear better if only one person is unmuted at a time. Thank you for that and now I'm going to turn it over to Angela who's going to introduce our speaker. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, so I want to uh, introduce Dr. Vittori. She actually spoke, presented last year um, in person. It may Maybe it was the second to last time in person before we had to stop and then go virtual, which is weird to think about. Um, but Dr. Tracy Vittori is an assistant professor in the College of Nursing at UT. She earned a Doctor of uh, Philosophy degree in nursing from University of Kentucky, go Cats, um, and has her master's degrees in science, nursing science, and education. Uh, Tracy was a scholar with the Rich Heart Scientists in Kentucky from 2012 to 2016 during the time when she focused on psychological distress in patients living with cardiovascular disease. So she's very well versed in this topic. Welcome, Dr. Vittori, and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just so thrilled to be back, so thank you. 
All right, I'm going to try to share my screen real quick and go right to my PowerPoint. I'm gonna hit uh, share. Okay, I'm gonna make it look like a PowerPoint. Let's try that again, get it up there. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody can see this. Is that correct? If it looks good on my end, I'm assuming it looks good on everybody else's end. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. So, okay. So um, again, I'm gonna to talk today just briefly about some ways that we can all improve our health, um, particularly focusing on prevention, things that shouldn't be too hard, but I say that with a tongue in cheek that every time we may have to make a, um, either a physical or a behavioral change, there's always some angst to that. So just, just some ways to improve our health. Uh, that impact the cardiovascular system. All right, so when I think of health, I think of health not only as the absence of illness or sickness, I actually look at it as health is the way that I wanna live my life to the fullest, the most quality type of life that I can leave uh, based on you know what I have uh, in my ability to, to live, right? So I try not to focus on you know, all the takeaways, but what do the takeaways, meaning like diet and exercise, what does that do to me and what does that do to my body? Because it's really through those prevention activities that hopefully I can live a fuller life and enjoy not only time with my friends and family, but with my grandkids and, and you know, do things that I want to do, not do things that I'm limited and I can only do because I'm limited. So that's my philosophy. And it really comes from... Um, um, an author, her name is uh, Hannah Green, and she's that's actually her pen name. She Her real name is Joanne Greensburg, and some of you may have read some of her book. Her most popular book is I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, and I just really liked her philosophy of health. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. But to begin, I wanted to really briefly talk about what cardiovascular disease is, and I'm actually going to bring in stroke a little bit here because as we've gone more into research, we are really classifying stroke as a type of heart disease. So cardiovascular disease or CVD you might see it listed in you know, advertisements or you know, uh, pamphlets and so forth, is a very serious uh, condition that affects the blood vessels around the heart and around other parts or other organs, we'll say. And when our blood vessels are really working um, well, it's like a well-oiled machine, if you will. Our heart, which I think of as a pump, our pump is working well. And what that means then is blood is flowing very or uh, oxygen-rich blood, nutrient-rich blood to the various organs uh, that it circulates to, which is just about every organ, right? So, but when cardiovascular disease comes into play, um, there's a clot build, built up. A clot is a, uh, another fancy word for fat, another fancy word for a calcium buildup. Um, those are the two words, or plaque might be the third word. Um, those are the words that are used to describe clots within our blood vessels. And what those clots do is they prevent free flowing blood to circulate throughout the blood, um, blood system. And so what happens is that if there's a narrowing, narrowing of the arteries, you might hear folks say, uh, that indicates that there's some buildup in the blood vessel. And so it narrows down the blood vessel. And so the blood that's trying to pump behind that clot, or that clog in the drain, is really working the heart really well. So the muscle behind all that is having to work really hard to move the blood forward. And so sometimes you'll see people will develop heart failure or cardiomyopathy, which are some diagnoses relative to the hypertension because it's really, you have to use a lot of pressure to get the blood through the heart through those narrowed arteries. So not having good constant blood flow throughout our body can cause serious um, illnesses and, and in fact can cause death. So. The fact that some people are born with certain congenital heart defects is one thing. But most of the cardiac diseases are a result of just poor choices, poor health choices, lifestyle choices, diet choices. And so thankfully, those are things that we can change and modify 
to have a better outcome in terms of our cardiovascular health. When we think of stroke, I always like to back up just a little bit. And, you know, stroke is really, um, can be one of two types of strokes. One is can be a, a hemorrhagic stroke is where one of the blood vessels just burst around the brain. And, um, and so that blood vessel is just pumping blood everywhere it can um, around the blood, uh, around the brain. And that's, that's one type of stroke. The other, and that's the, um, out of the two, that's the lesser of the two strokes. Um, the more, more common type of stroke is what we call an ischemic stroke. And that's where a blood vessel has a buildup of plaque or fat, or it's narrowed, the artery is narrowed. And it's instead of having a heart attack, you're having a brain attack. So it's the, the same type of disease process where the arteries are getting narrowed. It's just that the um, artery happens to be in the brain versus in the heart. Regardless if it's a ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, um, the, the outcomes can be pretty devastating. Some folks will have absolutely no, um, no problems recovering from a stroke. More times than not, there is some type of um, disability that comes from a stroke. And that can be you know, death right off the bat, if that's the hemorrhagic stroke, that tends to um, be more caustic right at the beginning. Um, or it might be difficulty swallowing or speaking or maybe limited with one um, side of the body. Um, th th things like that. Um, it can also be that the person hears and understands what an individual is talking about and they can understand that, but they can't respond appropriately. Or it could be that they speak fluently, but they don't understand the question being asked. So different types of aphasia. But when you brass tacks that down, Stroke is a type of narrowing of the arteries, which is the same as cardiovascular when you think of the heart. So instead of a heart attack, it's a brain attack. So that's why the American Heart Association is really bringing in stroke as another disease within the cardiovascular space. So when I'm talking about these prevention strategies today, think about them not only from a heart standpoint, but from a brain standpoint as far as how that might affect your life, right? So, you know, there, there are seven, there's probably more um, healthy behaviors that are known to positively influence um, health. And so when I think about and I talk to patients and I talk to my own parents about, you know, what can they do to minimize their risk of having poor outcomes in the cardiovascular diseases or even stroke? And these are the top ones that come into play over and over and over again. So when I look at this list, you know, most people try to oh, list them from one, to, this happens to be a list of seven, a list of one to seven of what they would say would be most important to their health. And from there, try to devise a scheme in terms of how to focus on them. But I have to share that although we hear that certain behaviors are more important than others, we really know that being at a healthy weight and eating right and regular exercising is really important. Um, but research is actually showing that if you can modify two to three to four of these, you actually get a bigger bang for your buck. Now, having said that, I don't know who amongst us can take four of these on at one time and really have some type of life that we enjoy. Like I can't imagine, I'm not a smoker, but if I was a smoker, trying to smoke and lose weight and exercise, and it, it, that's just overwhelming to me. Um, what I do think is realistic is looking at this list and saying to yourself, what, what is kind of low bearing fruit? What is an easy thing for me to do? Not that any of them are easy. But what is it that I can do and maybe focus on one of those for maybe a few months and then bring in a second one a few months later and and try to focus it that way. You know, according to the Surgeon General, quitting smoking is the single most important factor um, a smoker can do to improve their health. And in fact, as soon as the smoker stops smoking, 
the cells in their lungs, the cells in their arteries actually start going to work, repairing the inflammatory damage that has under, you know, that they've, uh, that they've triggered with the nicotine and the smoking. Um, and usually within a couple weeks, patients, people um, will start seeing some changes in their, in their ability to breathe deeper or maybe not see the stamina endurance from walking from their front door to their mailbox, but they'll start seeing some differences. And I will tell you, when we've looked at autopsies and we've looked at slides of patients that have smoked, and we can tell when they've smoked up until the time of their death or they've stopped um, and we, you know, they've stopped it, but they still had a, a catastrophic event and they died maybe two months, three months after their stop of smoking. Um, we can actually see different types of cells in their system in terms of regenerating cell and cell life and so forth. Um, I will share with you that when I speak with patients in the cath lab and they say that, well, I've smoked like a sieve, and I'll use that word, I've smoked like a sieve for 50 years. I don't know what smoking, you know, stopping smoking now is going to help me with. Um, I will say that working from a cardiac and a cerebral vascular standpoint, stopping smoking is huge. Um, if we've had to place stents in the heart, the nicotine itself will clog those stents back up. If you've had to have stents placed in your legs or in your abdomen for endovascular type of disease, uh, nicotine is so caustic to those stents that they'll close back up. And if that was a heart attack that brought you into the cath lab, you may not even get a month out of those stents before they clog back up. So nicotine is horrific in terms of um, stents and heart disease and really funneling and, and fueling, if you will, um, continued inflammation. If you, it, and I, I don't know what the cost is per pack of cigarettes, but I can only imagine that stopping smoking might actually help financially. Um, some folks that, and we all have our advice, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here perfect on a perch myself. I've got my own, you know, I need to stop eating myself. Um, but all of us have our vices. But if you think about the impact to us physically and alone sometimes financially, Maybe that's the, the trigger to help you kind of curtail that, you know, that advice that we have. Advice that we have. You know, in the state of Tennessee, you know, state of Tennessee, we are very lucky to have a quit line. And this, and I think it's actually is a quit line that's national, but in Tennessee, when you call it, if you're really focused on trying to curtail your smoking or reduce your smoking and hopefully quit smoking, you know, there's a couple different ways of doing it. One is cold turkey, which, oh my goodness, I can't imagine doing, but some people swear by it. Um, other folks work through their primary care physician and perhaps get um, some medications that have some hefty side effects, but may work as well. Some folks may use some patches that you can obtain over the counter. Um, and some folks go through behavioral therapy um, to try to help, you know, give strategies in times of stress that might help uh, help the patient, help the person individualize their care and, and make different choices at those high stress times. And this quit line actually provides free uh, coaches that can help individuals um, strategize and do some one on one uh, coaching and provide some opportunities to learn more about how how smoking impacts your life and how you might have some workarounds for that. So I just thought that was really neat that you would get a support from an online coach. Um, in today's world with COVID, everybody's online right now. And so it would be an acceptable way of getting some, some additional support and it's free. So, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with smoking and want to try to find another way of quit smoking, this might be a, a great avenue to explore. You know, my plate has been around for a while. And when I say my plate, it's actually the picture of a plate and how you divide a plate in terms of the types of food that one might eat. And um, this graphic here um, kind of outlines the different, hmm, I guess the different types of food and how we might proportionalize them on a plate. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is portion control. Now, I, I think we have to think through 
what's realistic in terms of portion control. You know, eating, I, when I think of this and I talk about this, I always think of Thanksgiving and how I load my plate up with the, the sweet potatoes because I just love sweet potatoes um, and I don't eat them very often. And so my plate tends to be heavy on the sweet potatoes and, and kind of little on the other stuff because I just want sweet potatoes. But that's not being very smart. And I realize that and I consider that a treat. But I also know that the day after Thanksgiving, they're just as good. And so I tend to um, eat a little bit more during the Thanksgiving holiday time. But truth be told, the better way of organizing your plate is to really look um, at portion control and having half of the plate really focused with vegetables and fruits and um, limiting your portions. Most uh, primary care physicians would say use your fist as a portion. So if you're thinking of a portion of chicken or fish or beef or potatoes or um, know, I'm just trying to make things up as I'm talking here, but the, the size of your fist is about maybe the size of a deck of cards and not to go any higher than that unless it's vegetables. Vegetables are really a, um, you can have a heavy, heavy arm in the serving of the vegetables. The other thing in terms of the plate is to focusing focus on the certain types of foods in your diet and really make sure that half of your plate is filled with fruits and vegetables. And then um, if you have the ability to change your grains to multi-grain, uh, that would be ideal. And of course, um, in your dairy, and you know, you think of dairy not only as like a glass of milk, but cottage cheese, maybe the creamer that you put in your coffee. Um, you know, sometimes we make certain drinks with, with milk, um, like smoothies, or um, if you're having the grandkids over and you're making hot chocolate, you know, things like that. Um, so don't just think of milk, but the cottage cheese and the other types of dairy that you might be using. If you can switch those to fat-free or low-fat, that helps with calorie control and um, fats. And then no, uh, no blood pressure or heart disease conversation would be complete without talking about uh, the salt shaker and making sure that you're really aware of the salt that you're ingesting in your diet. You know, most of the American diet and the foods that we eat are already sprinkled pretty heavily with salt. And so um, it doesn't take many many foods for us to get our daily allotment of sodium. So really putting extra salt on your meals is really instigating um, issues. If, in, if an individual is already taking blood pressure medicines, adding more salt through the diet could be very, very, um, it's, it's not a smart move. And the reason I say it like that is because if you're taking Lasix already, and you're adding more salt to your food, you're gonna retain more salt. And your Lasix is not gonna be very effective. If you're taking a blood pressure medicine like um, Losartan or hydrochlorothiazide or um, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones that, um, mm, lisinopril, um, those blood pressure medicines actually work through the kidneys. The kidneys secrete and retain salt. And those medications that you're buying and you're taking, um, the purpose of that is to kind of limit the, the minerals the kidneys are absorbing and they want the kidneys to excrete them so that the salt doesn't stay in your blood system so it doesn't increase your blood pressure. But if you're shaking on the salt on the side, you're, you're, you're canceling out your medications. So, that's why I say it's not smart because you're actually like, why are you buying those medications if you're um, already adding salt to your diet? So think of it that way in terms of you're already, your meal's already salted. You don't need to add any more salt. And I would encourage you to uh, folks to drink more water uh, instead of any of the sugary drinks that you might be um, wanting to consume. Um, you know, water to me is kind of boring to be honest with you, there's no flavor. Um, and it's a hard, hard turn to make. So I tend to drink more iced tea. Um, 
that's where I get my caffeine and I'm, um, you know, I drink it black. I don't add any sugars or anything to it, but um, if you could decrease your sugary intake, uh, that would be helpful as well because cardiac disease and diabetes are kind of like kissing cousins. They tend to go together. Um, so if you've got an increase in sugar coming along in your diet, it's not going to take much for that sugar to cause more inflammation and that inflammation will cause some cardiac disease. Um, you know, as I was thinking about like healthy diets and where I could go to get food, I just recently become aware of how good Aldi's is in terms of organic foods and price points. Um, so, you know, I'm not really, I'm not trying to push, you know, Kroger's or Food Lion or all, you know, but I would look at from a cost standpoint where you might get the biggest bang for your financial buck, right? And, um, you know, there are some choices that are better than others. And so from a, a diet standpoint, from a plate standpoint, I think if you could challenge yourself and look at ways to construct your plate that way, that might be helpful. You know, it's been well established that carrying extra weight has a negative effect on your health. And that actually can impact your sense of um, confidence and your sense of well-being. Um, you know, we also think about how chronic diseases and cancer rates come with being overweight, but there are also some other types of diseases that many people don't think about. You know, arthritis is a huge one, and I think about knees especially. You know, the knees, you have the, the two different bones on the knees, and then you have that little meniscal pad, which is kind of like a shock absorber between the two. And as people gain weight, we squeeze that shock absorber and the shock absorber kind of can blow and that's a meniscal tear. Um, and sometimes you have bone on bone and it, when you have arthritis, boy, that's really, really uh, quite painful. And sleep apnea is another one that folks don't think about. The diagnosis of sleep apnea uh, is actually correlated with obesity. And what happens is when you fall asleep and you're snoring, sorry, that's not very, you know, um, a nice picture there, but um, when you're snoring, you know, your, um, your tongue falls back and uh, obstructs your airway. And most people don't realize that when you do that, you actually increase your odds for developing atrial fibrillation, which is an, arrhyth an arrhythmia that can happen. The patients are not even aware that happens for the most part. And you have a higher risk for stroke when you have atrial fibrillation especially when you're not protected and on any blood thinners. So, you know, weight actually has a huge impact into chronic diseases and some of the aftermath we just don't know about because nobody's ever told us before. Or we're not putting the two and two together. Um, but just be aware that a lot of times we think of chronic diseases, um, but we may not think about some of the other ones, other types of diseases, arthritis or um, sleep apnea. And, you know, I'm sitting here, you can't see me, but I need to lose a little bit of weight. And I try and I try and I try and you know, I'm good for a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months. And then something happens, there's a special event and I fall off the horse for a little while. And it takes me a little while to get back. And I feel like I'm one step forward, five steps back. You know, I feel like I never make it over the hump. But I, I need to realize and remember, and, and hopefully you will as well, is that really small weight losses matter a lot. Um, and it, it happens that you know, if, if you've got chronic diseases like diabetes or, or, or cancer and so forth, just the small amount of weight loss actually helps level set the blood sugar. And you know, cancer may not have been the right example in this particular case, but diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, coronary disease, anything you can do to just decrease your weight just a little bit will help you. So if you're about 200 pounds, just 5% five, 5 might just be 10 pounds. Um, and that should have some effect, if you can't see it, but internally will have an effect on your blood pressure. And so really just small incremental changes is all we're asking for. You know, you may um, have heard or seen people described as fruits and, um, I chuckle a little bit about this because um, I, I never really thought about my husband being a pear or an apple. Um, but as I, I looked a little bit more into this, I can kind of see where this is going. 
So, but really understanding where you weigh, where you wear your weight really matters. Coronary disease is correlated with um, fat that's really maintained or held in the core, so in your belly area, and um, there's just a higher propensity of visceral or deep fat when it's carried in your stomach area. Whereas if it's carried more in the lower limbs or the hips or the, the legs, yes, you can have coronary disease, absolutely. But there's less coronary disease in patients that wear their fat on the lower limbs versus in their center. And by that, I mean, um, you know, the old commercial, if you pinch an inch, I think it was Special K that used that um, ad a long time ago. I think it was like, if you pinched an inch in your belly, you needed to lose weight. That's actually surface subcutaneous fat that's right underneath your skin. And if you had to say which type of fat is easier to lose, the subcutaneous fat is actually easier to lose than the visceral fat. When I talk with patients about uh, fat and so forth, I call visceral fat vicious. And I call it vicious for a reason because it's harder to lose and it squeezes your, or, your organs. So this visceral, this deep fat um, gets lodged you know, through your blood system. It lodges where it wants. And you know, if you can imagine your heart being compressed by fat, which is not like watery, it's, it's a compressed, thick, fibrinous type of uh, goop that's in your system. And if your heart's trying to, you know, love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, it's trying to pump against fat, it's not going to have the, the pumping power and um, it's going to have to work harder. And um, the compression itself may make the pump less effective. And I say that because the fat actually can be anywhere in your body. It can be around your heart. It can be around your kidneys. Um, it can actually be up in your brain. Um, and it can be around your eyes, believe it or not. And so, you, you know, when your organs are compressed by fat, it makes the, the body work harder. But unfortunately, you can't see that visceral fat. We can see it on autopsy. And I've been in the OR when I, you know, when, not me because I'm not a surgeon, but if a surgeon has is doing open heart surgery on a patient, I can see the degree of fat that the patient probably never knew they had. You know, they think of fat as on their arms or in their neck or maybe around their belly or something like that, but they don't think about the deep fat because nobody talks about it. It's the visceral fat that's very, very difficult to lose. Um, and it's very dangerous just because of the compression of the organs. But anything you can do from, you know, eating well, exercising, taking your your medications, your lipid medications is really, really important. I brought this slide in just to kind of further explain the process of how patients and people and you know adults and children develop coronary disease. And this is what it looks like, not only if it's around your heart, but if it's in your neck, your carotids, or if it's in your brain. On the most farther left side where the circle's pretty open and you don't really see any things at the bottom part, um, so I call that number one space. So when you look at the first circle, you can really see kind of the back end of the tunnel there. You can really see the back end of the blood, blood vessel. So that's like a blood vessel that's been cut in half and we're just looking forward into it, looking downstream. And in that first circle, you know, you can see the end. You can see where blood flow would be, be pretty decent. And then as, as you get older and your diet changes and you kind of hit midlife or down to circle number three, where you get a nice fatty pad underneath the, um, the lumen of the vessel that might start compressing upward. And then as you get into the fourth one, the fourth circle, you can see where you've really lost the full circle, the internal circle uh, to more of a half, half moon or a half circle. And you can see more yellow and more plaque and fat kind of compressing. Um, and limiting where blood flow should be more naturally going. And that's what happens is when um, the plaque builds up like that, the blood starts becoming sluggish. It can't get through the blood vessel. And so the heart has to pump a little bit harder to get it through the, the blood vessel to get it to the vital organs. So, you know, we talk about exercise and I think I shared with you already that I need to do a little bit more exercise myself. The American Heart Association really recommends um, for uh, us over the age of 60, 
uh, to get about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. They also say you could, instead of 150 minutes per week of moderate, you could do 75 minutes of vigorous. Okay, so if you haven't been on an exercise regimen for a while, that seems pretty extreme to me. So I would offer just start moving. If you could move um, around your subdivision, you know, when it's safe to do so, if it's not snowy and icy and so forth, and it's right now under COVID restrictions, you're not in a good, you know, big group of people, but under normal circumstances, if it's just yourself, or if it's uh, maybe you and your significant other or something like that, your circle, your bubble, your consistent bubble, I think they use that coined word, um, walk around the subdivision or, you know, even if you can just walk from your front door to your mailbox at the beginning, um, if you are able to drive and you're able to get to the mall and do the mall walking, you know, obviously you would have your mask on and take the, prote you know, uh, protections and so forth. Um, that would be a good start. Ideally, if you could get up to, you know, biking or swimming, um, you know, even low intensity activity would be better than nothing. I was just did a, uh, a little bit of a review with two colleagues from the University of Tennessee, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Harris, and we were looking at uh, patients that um, kind of rated their uh, type of intensity, frequency of activity and their ability to have, or I shouldn't say their ability, their, the outcome of having memory issues. And what we found was the more active you were, even if it was just a little bit of activity, um, the less memory problems patients had. So really even just a little bit of activity will even take not only the heart into consideration, but memory, cognitive, um, you know, how fast you're thinking and so forth, um, have an impact with that. Strength training is also really important. Um, I don't know many people that have barbells sitting around their backyard or in their family room, for goodness sakes. But I do know many people can open their pantry and see canned goods. And so you can use cans of beans, cans of peas, water bottles, tomatoes, and start looking at building some muscle. Any muscle building is better than none. What we're trying to do is convert some of that fat and convert it over to muscle. And slow, steady progress really wins here. So strength training twice a week is really important. I mean, obviously, if you've been very physically fit for years and you do have ankle weights and so forth available to you, hey, more power to you. Um, but if you're just kind of trying to figure out what can I do that's in the realm of, you know, possibilities, let's look at that. What I share with some of my patients is even if you can't do any of that, you're limited for whatever reason, you just had a knee replacement or, you know, you're recovering from X, Y, Z, and you just really want to do something, but you're limited. I, I tell patients as you, if you're microwaving something or if you're, you know, cooking something in the kitchen, stand with your hands on the counter and start twitching and I shouldn't say twitching, but flexing your ankles and stand on your toes and then maybe stand on your ankles and then stand on your toes again, and then maybe start bending in a knee here and bending in a knee there. But, you know, have your hands on the, the counter to kind of balance you. Because um, what you want to do is obviously increase your flexibility, but also maintain balance. And I would be um, uh, remiss if I didn't say any type of exercise program really needs to be in concert with your primary care physician, making sure that, you know, he or she is... Um, uh, I should say provider, not just necessarily physicians, but providers to make sure that he or she are, are well in tune with what your goals are, number one, but to see what they can do to help you. Okay. This is what I see in a cat lab <laughs> is that patients will say, yeah, I'm, I'm working out. And then I sit there and say, okay, well, how, how much are you working out? I don't, you know, I don't care. Just tell me, just give me a number. And then the family is there at the bedside saying, yeah, he doesn't work out or she doesn't work out. I don't know what she's talking about. And it's usually the, either the spouse or the kids are ratting their parent out. That's usually what happens. Um, and, and uh, I, I think the, the, the point here is just be honest with your provider and share where you're at. And they may say, hey, we need to work on this and see what we can do to get you moving. Or you might say, I need to get moving and I need help. And what suggestions might you might you have for me after I get over this, you know, urgent health issue that I'm working with, especially if I'm talking to somebody in the cath lab. Um, but 
most of us need to start somewhere. And uh, this is not where to start. We just have to figure out the right plan for you. So the other thing to take into consideration is uh, the risk with alcohol. You know, alcohol actually increases your risk for a variety of different cancers. Most people think just liver. But having worked at U the University of Cincinnati, um, I worked in a unit that patients had larynx cancer and esophageal cancer, throat cancers. And some of it was because they smoked, okay, or they chewed. Um, but sometimes it was because they drank. And so really being aware of um, not only the, the sugary content within the alcohol that can increase your um, risk for heart disease, diabetes, but also the risk for cancer. So the recommendation for men is two drinks a day and women it's one drink a day. And I think that's grossly unfair because I don't think my husband likes his alcohol any better or worse than me. It's just that um, I metabolize, being a female, I, I metabolize alcohol slower. And so um, you won on that one, if you will. Uh, so it's, it's unfair, I know. Um, and are there times where I drink more than one, you betcha. Um, but I usually pay the price on the scale the next day or so. So um, just be aware that alcohol is, is, we're not saying don't drink. Just, just be aware of the effect alcohol can have on your body. You know, sleep is another thing to take into consideration. I love to sleep. Um, my husband's an early riser. I, I tend to like mm, kick the covers and say, no way, Jose. But, um, you know, there's negative effects of oversleeping and undersleeping. But, you know, the goal is seven to eight hours a night. I will say it's been years since I've slept seven or eight hours. You know, are there times I have? Yes, there are. But I'm usually more in the six hour, five to six hour range. And I've noticed that as I've, I've gotten a little bit older, um, the sleeping doesn't um, come as naturally to me. I, I tend to um, have to really get things dark and cold for me to sleep. But, you know, sleep can affect your health and your cardiovascular health. Um, quite a bit. Actually, not getting enough sleep, I'm sorry, not over, oversleeping actually is correlated with overeating, believe it or not. And not getting enough sleep is related to concentration issues and higher anxiety and depression. So um, be aware that sleep has negative effects. And if there's anything you can do to improve your, your health, that's good. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else there on the sleeping side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. I was thinking there was something to say about um, sudden cardiac death with those that sleep too long. Um, and I think there is something there and I should have just kept my mouth shut. So I don't know the exact correlation there, but I think there is something. In terms of medication, I wanted to share um, some things with people in terms of some strategies to make sure that you're taking your medications as prescribed, um, but also being safe with your medications. And I say that only from the perspective that I work as a nurse practitioner in a hospital where I sometimes discharge patients home. And I know that when they come into the hospital, they either came because they needed to come or they came because somebody called the squad and brought them in. But eventually the patient or their loved ones will bring in a brown bag with all of their pills in them or somebody will have a sheet of paper, an index card of something listing all their medications. And I say that because what we do with that information is we upload that information. I mean, we literally look at the, the bottle and then we type in the computer what what you as a patient are prescribed. And so at the time of discharge, you're ready to go home. We look at what you brought us and what you're on at the hospital and try to reconcile those differences, right? What we don't know is what's in your medicine cabinet that you've got, you know, stuck back there in the corner, just in case, the just in case shoebox medicines, right? That's all in there. And so uh, we don't know that. And so what I have patients um, work with is the, uh, the pharmacist. I consider the pharmacist your protector from me because I, what I don't want to do is prescribe something that I don't even have visibility that you've got at home on your, in your bathroom shelf, right? That's not in that bag and list. 
And so really being aware when you go home, know that medications are called different names and how we talk about them in the hospital um, and even in the physician's office may be very different than what you are, what you know is your bottle that's sitting right there in your hand or on your medicine cabinet. Um, the other thing is that pills, I have this colorful picture here for a reason, is that pills are colored differently for a variety of reasons and the colors change on you. As a young nurse practitioner, what I did when I was discharging patients home from surgery, I would, I thought I was being smart, I would have the pharmacist package these medications in small packets and I would have them, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning, take this packet and it had all your pills, your vitamins, your aspirin, your, your beta blocker. I had everything packaged for you. And then 9 p.m. I had this, you know, you had your Lipitor, the, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what else, but other medicines all there, maybe your Pepsid or something. I had everything there for you. What I did not realize when you're home, your heart rate might go up or down, your blood pressure might sink. You may need to take a double dose of Lasix. So when the patient's calling into the office and they're saying, hey, I'm gaining too much weight after this. I, you told me to call if I gain three pounds or more in a day. Um, I don't know what to do. And so then we would say, well, increase your Lasix, take another dose of Lasix. Well, when a packet, you don't know which one's Lasix. They're not labeled. They're just all the pills were put in the packet. The other problem is that patients tend to identify their pill with their color. Oh, is that the blue one? Is that the is that the yellow one? And we don't know because how Kroger labels and markets and gives you your Lasix could very well be different than Food Lion, which could be different than Publix. And so we don't know that. What I wish they would do is just leave all the medications one color, and that way we know what medicine. You know, you you have to know the names. We have to know your the names of those medicines that you're on, and so that's a problem. So I would say. As best you can, try to either use apps if you're you're very savvy in um, the the IT world, or use the pill boxes that you can get free from the pharmacist within a hospital. And Kroger's will give them to you free, and use them to set your pills. Taking medications as prescribed is really important in the cardiovascular world because we're really trying to maintain your weight, right? Trying to maintain your lipid levels, your cholesterol levels and your heart rate and blood pressure. And all of those affect not only your heart, but it affects your head in terms of um, brain health and um, you know, from the stroke standpoint and so forth. So, but we don't think about all of the pieces that go into play with medications. Medications are expensive. Um, even if you get the freebies at, at um, you know, Kroger's and different Walmart sometimes runs, you can get these pills free there, but you know you can't get all of them free there. You can get some of them free. It's it's a gain, it seems like. Um, but medications are expensive, and they they really take a dent into um, people's livelihood. But making sure that we take them smartly and we're informed about them. Um, don't ever hesitate to when you go to pick up your pills at the pharmacy, ask for the pharmacist to sit down and go over them with you. Make sure you know what meds you're taking. Um, and it's important if, if you have the ability to share really what you're taking with your loved one. So, and you know, God forsake something happens and somebody else is dependent on sharing that information, they are aware of the medications as well. So there are seven healthy habits and behaviors that I went through today. And a combination of these really will prolong your life, hopefully improve the quality of that life, and just hope make you feel better. So the question I have for you is which of the seven will you make as a priority to improve your health? So with that, I'm going to close out and open for any questions. Once I figure out how to stop sharing this. Ooh. So I'm going to unmute everyone. If you're on a telephone, you can press star six um, and you can unmute yourself if you have a question. I have a question. Um, I'm not on any, I'm 67 and I'm not on any medication. I do take vitamins and my doctor told me to stop because I have been taking like the 81 aspirin. Mm -hmm. 
since I was probably about 55, you know, my doctor just told me to, you know, because of my age, I should start taking it. But now, of course, he's retired and all that stuff. And the doctor that I have now told me that I need to stop taking it. And so I quit taking it. So he said the new recommendation is that it's not good for you. So. Yeah, there are, there are, you're, you're correct. Uh, the, the guidelines right now is unless you have a specific targeted rationale to take it, they are saying not to take it. Does that make many of us in the healthcare field kind of queasy in the stomach? Absolutely. Um, but right now the recommendations are to stop taking it unless you have like a cardiovascular reason to take it. Um, you know, aspirin and any of the Plavixes or I, I can't think of all the names, they actually, once you take one aspirin, just so you know, if you're taking it for a headache, whatever you're taking it for, um, it takes out over 50% of your platelets right away. And platelets regenerate on a weekly basis. So the platelets that you just lost because you took aspirin for your headache won't be replenished until the week after. They take seven days. So if you have somebody chronically taking aspirin for, you know, for a um, presumed preventative type of um, raisin, you're really limiting that person's ability to clot if they if they get into a car accident or if they have some other types of issues. Um, you know, your clotting factors are kind of um, uh, prepared and managed by your liver. And so the aspirin really affects the liver as well. And so that's where that recommendation is coming from. We have used aspirin, really once you got over the age of 55, I think we started recommending taking aspirin, a baby aspirin once a day from now to eternity. That's like statins, we recommend that for everybody. Um, but we've really started chiseling back those recommendations because we've seen a number of patients get into scenarios where we can't stop the bleeding. I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my cholesterol uh, was like 209. Mm -hmm. And so, but my good cholesterol out of that was 93. So I asked my doctor, I said, so he told me I needed to watch it. I said, so what should I do to get it down since my good cholesterol was, in fact, he said he'd never seen one that high before. So, um, What's the recommendation or do I need to worry? He said, well, just leave it alone for right now. So do I need to worry if, you know, if it's that, but my good cholesterol, when those two are added together, is what put it over the top when it was off the chart high. So, so I would say, uh, your, your good cholesterol is actually protecting you right now uh, from your over 200 total cholesterol. I would strongly encourage you to really watch what you're eating, you know, diet control right now, and um, really watch desserts and alcohol. And I say that because the trans fat from the desserts and the extra calories from the, and you wouldn't think calories and cholesterol from the alcohol, um, and I'm not sure if you're a drinker or not, you didn't disclose it, I'm just giving alcohol. recommendations. Um, but I would really Desert, watch. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I would really watch um, the fats and uh, the desserts. And sometimes people have better results if they change from canola oil, like if you're cooking, to like an avocado or an olive oil. So using good fats um, will help you and, and give you better protection than um, canola oil, which is a, a cheaper. Um, uh, less less protective, cardio protective oil. And I say that um, avocado oil you can cook with, kind of deep fry with, um, um, just cook in the skillet. And um, olive oil doesn't cook in the skillet real well. A, a dash here and there, you, know, you can get some onions kind of browned and so forth, but from a pure cooking, if you're cooking something in, in the skillet, Olive oil isn't really the best oil to use. Uh, uh, avocado oil is actually better. It's a it's a healthier fat. Diane, did you have a question? I noticed you had unmuted at some point. Were you going to ask a question? Were you going to ask a question? 
No. 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 We, we're good. You think, Mary Sophia? Well, um, Dr. Tracy, how's your mom? The last time you were on, you said that she had had to have some uh, uh, surgery. How's your mom? You know what? My mom's doing much better. Thank you so much for asking. I had forgotten I had shared that. Yeah, she's doing better. She is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good. It's a it's a weird time right now, right? With COVID, you yeah. can't visit people. and But, you know, we try to do the uh, Zooming and so forth every so often. And that's always a, a treat, right? Trying to get everybody to not talk over everybody, but also to get connected. And there's always connection issues. But yeah, thank you for checking in with, with me on her. She's doing great. Thank you. Good. Peggy, you're just muted. Let me see. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Doctor, um, I manage the Affordable Medicines Program here at the Office on Aging. And what do you think about the newer branded medicines like for the blood thinner and the uh, insulin and these things that are costing over a hundred dollars a month. Uh, do you think those are valuable to the patients? Mm, you know, that's a hard question. Um, and I hedge on you here because some of those, give me an example. Let me ask you before I um, answer that question. What exactly, what medications are you specifically targeting on this question? What about Eliquis. Yeah. So, um, uh, they, I think they've promoted it because since the affiliation with the atrial fibrillation. Yeah. So they're, say they're preventing that. Yeah. So Eliquis is a really a good, um, we call it a NOAC um, or DOAC. It's dual antiplatelet um, medication. And it's used a lot of times for patients that have atrial fibrillation. And really, once you take one or two pills, you're totally fully anticoagulated. Um, so you're fully protected um, from, from stroke. That's what's the belief. Eliquis is, is um, um, the superiority of that medication is, um, was initially thought to be, that medication was more thought to be superior because it was protective of the kidneys. And that's what they, the uh, pharmaceutical companies really touted is in terms of why this medication is better than uh, some of the other ones, Plavix and so forth. Um, I think there's a place for all of these medications, but I think there are really good alternatives to some of these medications as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the one that my dad's on right now, um, and I'm blanking. It's not Eliquis. It's the other one. It's a... 20 milligram tablet, and I can't think of it off the top of my head. Is it is it Zeralto? It is Zeralto. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I would I I'm kind of leaning towards the Zeralto right now versus the Eliquis because as I've looked at the studies on the Eliquis, yes, they did test on um, those patients that had kidney dysfunction, but they only tested on a small portion. Their numbers of patients weren't that they weren't that large studies. They were very small studies. They were secondary studies. Um, and so I'm not 100% convinced that Eliquist outranks the Zeralto right now. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold my weight on that right now. But some of the medications are more tolerable by some patients than others. And so I think that there's a place for some of these medications. But I don't think it should be a broad brush stroke. This is the medication that you need to use. I, I don't think that's the right approach. Thank you. What, what I have found in, in my practice is that um, for patients who are homebound, mm -hmm. these medications prevent them from having to either somehow get in the car and get to someplace to have their Coumadin level checked or have a nurse come into the home and do a Coumadin level check because Eliquis and Zarelto and all of those don't require level checks. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times the doctors have switched to those simply because they know it's a hardship for the patient to get out and about. 
You know, and those are fair statements. And as more medications are being developed for rescue um, of those medications, what I haven't shared with the audience is those two medications are, um, are difficult because if, if a person who's taking one of those two medications get into a car accident, they will start bleeding and the bleeding is pretty profuse and trying to stop that bleeding can be very difficult. Now, both of those medications have um, rescue medications that we can give patients to get that bleeding under control pretty quickly, but they cost an arm and a leg. Um, whereas Coumadin, the old time medication, um, which works really pretty well um, still, has an immediate anecdote to it. Um, that we can give and get the blood clotting under control. Having said that, Coumadin is, um, is not as good as the Xeralto and the um, Eliquist in certain cases. And so, you know, it's a decision point between those, those medications, um, but know that the risk of taking those more powerful blood thinners is that they're um, there may, they're developing more and more anecdotes to those medications, but they're still pretty expensive. And sometimes they're only available to certain emergency rooms. So if you, you know, the ambulance brings you into one hospital because it happens to be the closest hospital to the crash that you were just in or where you reside and so forth. Um, the anecdote is at the other hospital and they may or may not share it with that hospital. And so that's a problem, but you know that's an extreme circumstance. I grant, I, I you know, I grant that. Um, but I think that there's a place for many of these medicines. But I don't know if it needs to be everybody be, needs to be on this type of medicine. But I think you bring up a great point in terms of really looking at the individual patient and looking to see what's available. And, and you know, getting patients out for Coumadin requires you know weekly, monthly, especially if you're titrating um, blood blood samples, and that's mm -hmm. it, it's irritating. Uh, there's a cost associated with it, and um, it requires you to get out, right? So, okay, I got one more question. This mm -hmm. is a COVID question. Okay, um, I hope I can are answer. Are there any medications or categories of medications that you think people should stop before getting the vaccination to maximize their immunity? I'm hedging on you. I don't, I don't know if I'm really comfortable making that dis, that that answer. I, 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 I have heard, know. you know, I've heard that the uh, ibuprofen, NSAIDs may set it you up a condition where you do not respond as fully to the vaccine. So I didn't know if there's a resource yet on that. I know I'm, I'm not finding a lot of the answers to my COVID questions just because this is new territory for everyone. It is. It is. And in fact, I had a, a caller last week who called and she has a post COVID condition. And I looked it up and Johns Hopkins even recommends um, a certain medication. It's very expensive. Her daughter, doc, doctor wrote it for her, but she can't pay for it. Um, Anyway, that's just something we haven't gotten to yet. And we, I mean, we read about the post COVID conditions, you know, the complications, especially after you're on a respirator, uh, but there's no recommended treatment for that yet. No, and, I, and the reason I hedge is that the, you know, the COVID vaccines that are available right now are not live viruses. So you're not getting COVID. They're not even introducing COVID to your skin when you get the shot, right? You're getting some um, ability, modulating abilities of your um, um, fight, fighting cells, your, 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 um, your white cells to act on foreign material. So, you know, when you're asking the question specifically towards the vaccine, I don't know that. Now, I know if you have COVID, that's a different story. Yeah, stay away from the, uh, you know, the ibuprofen as much as you can because of the liver impact. But in terms of the vaccine, I know I got the first shot and that was one of the questions before I got the shot. I don't think they were going to say I couldn't get it if I had had ibuprofen. I think they're trying to get data, you know, to see if it is affecting. You know, you, yeah, I've had the vaccine um, and that was one of the qualifying questions um, in terms of are you taking that medication? Um, and then, of course, if you've had any type, any any type of reactions to uh, medications. And it wasn't necessarily like a 
antibiotic or a previous immunization reaction. It was any reaction to any medication, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of interesting that they were exploring all types of medication reactions. Um, I just haven't seen the literature on vaccinations and ibuprofen, so I can't, I don't know if I'm, I'm really the person to speak about that. Okay. Oh, um, sorry, thank you. I, I will say that yesterday, because it came from CDC, I read the article about the ibuprofen with the vaccine. And what CDC is recommending is that you don't take it before you before. get the vaccine, just before you get, don't pre-medicate with ibuprofen before you get the vaccine, you'll get a better response if you don't. That doesn't affect whether you take it later on because you get a sore arm or, or you're having symptoms, but just that they're recommending you don't pre-medicate. Okay, thank you, yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we'll let you uh, get on with your day. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Um, very, very informative presentation. Um, I just looked at my food drawer here at work and it needs some work. <laughs> All right. Oh, work in progress, right? Well, thank you again to your audience for inviting me back. I appreciate it. And again, if there's ever anything I can do for you guys, just reach out. Uh, the team there knows how to get a hold of me and it would be my honor to do so. So thank you so much. And I will scoot out of here so you can finish up your, your meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, well, thank you guys. We will be back um, on March 11th for our next presentation. So we hope to see you next month. Thank you.